The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. And since the graph is one of the foremost on-chain data sources, I really do believe that it's in a unique position to help onboard the next billion users. Chainbrain, a no-code business intelligence tool that allows users to easily search and generate visualizations from blockchain data. You may have already met Marissa or a member of the Chainbrain team at a recent hackathon or during the Graph's recent community talk when Chainbrain was highlighted. During this interview, Marissa talks about her background, including time competing in fencing both at NYU and on the Israeli national team going to work in Web2 as a data scientist, launching Chainbrain and how it works, including some incredible use of artificial intelligence, and how Chainbrain not only won some bounties from the graph at recent hackathons, but how it leverages subgraphs for its own product. As always, we started the discussion talking about Marissa's educational background. I went to NYU Stern, where I studied business economics and computer science and math. Marissa, I've had this happen on the podcast before where a guest has studied things that at surface level don't seem to relate very well together. You got economics, computer science, and math. Do these different fields relate more to each other than maybe meets the eye? Yeah, I think so. Economics is the study of choice, allocation, and efficiency and has a lot of applications for computer science. So economics is kind of like the overall theory. And while the theory is really interesting, I was curious about the underlying data that makes the theory work. So data science and machine learning can be used to obtain so much information and like you can analyze this data to demonstrate meaningful research. So there's a lot of different areas that combine the two, like algorithmic game theory, market design. Uh, There's really a lot of interactions between economics and machine learning. Every once in a while on the GRTIQ podcast, there's a GRTIQ podcast first. These are getting rarer as I interview more and more people within the Web3 community. But during your time in college, you were on the fencing team at NYU. What can you tell us about fencing and what you were doing there? I got into fencing because I saw a movie called The Parent Trap with Lindsay Lohan. Great movie if you haven't seen it. And I saw it and I was like, I want to do that. So I begged my parents to let me go to a fencing studio. We found one near me. Um, I'm from DC originally. So I went to Silver Spring for fencing training and I got really into it. I liked it because fencing sometimes called physical chess because it combines not only physical activity, but the mental uh, capacity of like chess. You're always thinking about what your opponent's going to do and how your actions are going to make your opponent react. So I started fencing right before high school and wanted to fence in college. I got recruited at NYU and had the pleasure of being on the NYU fencing team as well as the Israeli national fencing team. And I got to compete internationally for them. That's incredible. And again, I haven't ever spoken with anybody that has competed at this level in fencing. Take us inside that world for a minute here. What can you tell us about the sport itself? Like, is it really competitive? And and how does the scoring work? Yeah. Fencing has three different weapons, actually. There's epee, foil, and saber. I did epee, which is a weapon where you can hit with the point and you can hit anywhere on the body, including the toes, the mask, anywhere. And there's no right-of-way rules. Foil and saber have right-of-way rules. Foil, you hit with the point as well, and you hit on like the torso up. A saber is the traditional slashing weapon that you've maybe seen in movies like Zorro, etc. And there's also right away rules and you hit from the waist up, including the arms and the mask as well. So fencing, how it works is there's first a round of pools where you fence to, you fence like five, six people to five touches each. And then after that, you get seated into direct elimination bouts where you fence three, three minute periods to 15 touches. 
or when the time expires. Um, and whoever wins that match goes on to the next round and that just continues. So if you win a competition, you've won pretty much all your bouts. You could have lost a pool bout, um, but you, you've won all of your direct elimination bouts. And so what makes someone good at fencing? Like what are the skill sets or what are the qualities one must possess? So different weapons have different skills, I would say. Saber, it moves really fast. So you need to be like stockier and have bigger legs. Whereas Epe, uh, traditionally fencers are taller in Epe. But I would say like overall, hardworking fencers are generally one of the smarter sports, I would say, because you have to think a lot for fencing. It's not really like a sport where you're being knocked around. It's really strategic. So I think the ability to strategically think and also have a really good sense of timing is important for every single weapon. Appreciate that background. At some point, you fall in love with data science based on what you're working on now and what we're going to talk about in a little bit here. But what's the backstory about your interest in data science and what pulled you into that field? So when I was in college, I interned at Dow Jones as a data scientist over the summer where I really got hands-on experience uh, building machine learning models and understanding the practical implications of those models. I also had the opportunity to do a data science fellowship called TavTech over winter break in college. Um, So we like studied from nine to four, uh, all different like machine learning and deep learning models, as well as the math behind it. I think both of those gave me great exposure to work in data science when I came out of college. I think for me, data science is like a treasure hunt for the answer. And each time you write a bit of code, you peel back another layer like an onion until you get to the center of the issue. That pursuit of truth really interests me. What does a data scientist do? I think a data scientist is really focused on extracting meaningful insights from a large amount of data. So utilizing things such as math, um, statistics, computer science, as well as machine learning models to do this is really at the core of what a data scientist does. Well, eventually after college, you make your way to TeamPay. What is TeamPay and what did you do there? TeamPay is a distributed spend management platform designed to simultaneously empower employees to purchase whatever they need for work while also giving finance controls and visibility into spend as it's happening. So we had a lot of transaction data coming in and I worked on building machine learning models to improve transaction categorization, vendor matching, fraud detection. And I worked with internal users to help them increase their reliance on data and understand how they could make better decisions for whatever field they were in. So at TeamPay, it was probably your first experience then putting your interest in data science to work professionally. I always like to ask this question as well, when someone has a passion and an interest in a subject and then has the opportunity to go to work doing it full time, did it check all the boxes? Was it as interesting and as fun as you had hoped it would be working in data science? Yes, I think I learned a lot at TeamPay, especially because I was around employee number 30 there and we grew to around 120. So I got to see the evolution of a startup over time, which was very interesting to me. I got exposure to a wide variety of things and also had a lot of autonomy over my day-to-day and what I wanted to work on. So at some point you become interested in crypto. When was that? And do you recall what you thought at the time when you first became aware of crypto? I had been hearing about crypto for a while. I remember I had someone that I was studying math with in maybe sophomore year of college, 2015. And he sent me some crypto at the time. I didn't really do anything with it. Of course, the classic story goes is I don't have the seed phrase for that wallet anymore, but I don't think it was a large amount. But I think I really got interested in crypto since around 2019. I started buying and selling my own. I really saw the power in owning an asset that wasn't controlled by the monetary policy of a federal government. And beyond that, I think the power of blockchain and having a decentralized immutable ledger where you can store data on really resonated with me. And I think one of the things that I'm super interested in is all of the different applications on top of the blockchain. So one thing that's super cool to me is building machine learning models on the blockchain and using zero knowledge proofs to create a privacy preserving machine learning model where you're not sacrificing patient information. For example, you're you're maintaining HIPAA compliance and you're able to train machine learning models on data that you wouldn't otherwise have access to because there's no way to guarantee that the patient data is protected without something like zero knowledge proofs. 
The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, gaps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. Marissa, I want to ask you this question about data in the context of crypto and that early exposure and then kind of what you're doing now. What does a data scientist see in the value of blockchain or the value of crypto that other people may not even see? Yeah, blockchain is super unique in that all of the data is on chain and transparent. It's a data scientist's dream. There's a wealth of information that's easily accessible as long as you know how to access it. What do you say to people who aren't working in Web3 or who haven't had these epiphanies when it comes to blockchain or crypto to say, you know, we've got enough data. There's enough data in the world. Google's got plenty of it. LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Everybody's got data. We don't need these innovations. There's enough data in the world. The power of Web3 is bringing data ownership back to the individual. Instead of Google or Facebook owning troves of data in a data center or somewhere in the world, now the user has ownership over their own data and the control is back in the user's hands. So I guess what you're saying is then for people who aren't sure we need crypto or a public blockchain or ledger with more data, what you're saying is the shift here is that it's putting ownership of that data back in the hands of the user? Yes, exactly. It's really powerful to be able to own your own data and decide how you want it to be used, whether you want to monetize it. Instead of Facebook selling your data to advertisers, for example, I can now sell my own data and monetize my own data as a commodity. Well, Marissa, we're talking today because you eventually make a move full time into Web3. You leave TeamPay and you're working on a very cool project that we're going to talk a lot about here in a moment. If you don't mind, though, just tell us then. You become aware of crypto early in college. You go to work as a data scientist working in, I'll call it a Web 2 type of environment. And now you're in Web 3. What was that journey like to leaving Web 2 to go to work in Web 3? Yeah, like I said, I was interested in kind of buying and selling crypto, but I think I started to make more moves into the Web 3 space. When I did the 30 Days of Web 3 course by Women Build Web 3 in August of 2022, And then after that, I started playing around with some side projects, and I decided to take the leap full-time in January of 2023. I remember that 30 days of Web3 with Women Build Web3, and I've had other guests of the podcast on before that are very involved in Women Build Web3 as well. So take us through that. What were you learning in those 30 days, and how valuable was that for you as someone who was participating? The course was really designed for people that had a technical background to understand the technical side of Web3. So we, we, I, that was the first time I learned about the graph, actually. I learned how to deploy a subgraph in that course and a lot of other useful things that I've taken with me till today. So I think at first glance, people see these programs on Twitter, and it could be from you know a whole host of reputable sources, but people don't generally believe It's really going to change your career and put you in motion on something entirely different. But in your case, it did. Yeah, I think it started the motion. I think it also helped that I had a technical background and could easily absorb the information in a way that someone I think that didn't have that technical background couldn't. So it was just understanding kind of the data structures of on-chain data, the different tools that people use, and learning all of that within a 30-day period. And as you're making that move in a Web 2 environment and studying data in a Web 3 environment, does the structure and the way to access and kind of analyze the data, does all of that transfer over pretty easily for you? 
I always say that I think data science is one of the most like transferable skills and it's very industry independent because no matter what industry you're in, your data is going to look different than a different industry. If I was in like medical data, completely different than financial data. So I think since I had a background in transaction data, although it was like web to traditional transactions, I understood kind of some of the structure, some of the attributes a bit better and made it easier, I think, to onboard onto Web3 data. What are you telling family and friends or even your colleagues as you're ramping up your interest in Web3, what you're doing and what you're working on? Yeah, I really explained to them the concept of Web3 and how it offers users an immutable and transparent way to store information. And I explained my passion about bringing data ownership back to the individual, but I'm still pretty sure they think I work on internet money. <laughs> so that's an important point. And it comes up on the podcast all the time, right? Because people's initial interest or ideas as it relates to crypto and Web3 is the speculative nature of it all. But you have a very refined sense of the utility of blockchain and the benefits of Web3, especially within this lens of data. So how do you navigate that? I mean, personally or among friends and in, in your personal network, this interplay between the speculation of it all, but the real utility of it all? The power of blockchain is much larger than just the currencies on top of it, although those are extremely powerful, especially for developing nations. I'm more interested in the utility side of the blockchain and the applications built on top of it. So I try and draw that distinction when talking to other people. I also try to ignore the speculative noise because I believe in the long-term power of blockchain to solve societal problems like supply chain management, personal data protection, music licensing, DAOs, and using zero-knowledge proofs to build privacy-preserving machine learning models. Marissa, using then the perspective of a data scientist, how is the data in crypto, Web3, or, or on blockchain better or more valuable or more useful than legacy systems? With Web2, the problem is that data exists in multiple databases, data sets, formats. And the beauty of Web3 is that the data is public in a standardized format, available and accessible to everyone. But due to this mass amount of blockchain data, it's really hard to navigate this wealth of information and extract meaningful insight. Um, on-chain data is really one-dimensional and static. And since it's super like difficult to understand, businesses are making decisions without actually understanding the underlying data. Is there enough data in Web3 presently to make it useful or interesting for people in the world? Or is it still too emergent? I think that there's enough data. There's a bunch of different blockchains and protocols that each have a wealth of information. I mean, we're still early. So I would say the data is on the earlier side, but there is an abundance of information. Well, listeners will know that there are different types of blockchains. And this was something for me when I moved into Web3 that took me a long time to kind of understand because I just thought everything ran on Ethereum, for example. But you find that there's L2s for sure, but there's other competitive blockchains in Web3. And all of them are capturing data. So my question would be, if you apply that lens as a data scientist, how would you explain the utility of having a multi-chain environment in Web3 where someone's using blockchain A for this and another person's using blockchain B for that? How do you think through those things? I think that's really the beauty of blockchain is that it can be so amorphous and that it can take on any shape that the user is interested in, whether that's for health data or social data, such as Lens Protocol or NFTs, you can really use it as a vehicle for many different assets, currencies, or data. In your own mind then, having worked in a Web2 environment very intensive on transactional data, and then seeing it and analyzing it in Web3, have you developed greater conviction for the fact that Web3 is fundamentally different. It hides identity. It really does protect user data and that it really is in opposition to, as I say, kind of the sins of Web2. I mean, have you built that conviction based on the experiences you've had? I do think that Web3 protects the identity of people much more than Web2. That being said, there are some 
interesting techniques where you can de-anonymize information through machine learning, such as clustering or looking at transaction timestamps. If you think back to every major hack, the government has tracked down the perpetrators by looking at transaction amounts, timestamps, even if they've mixed or scrambled their currency. So while I do think it's much more anonymous and there are ways to take precautions for that, it isn't as completely anonymous as people think. Well, that's really interesting. And I, I know that that answer is true. I mean, I read the headlines and I think every listener to the podcast will know that the governments are able to do these types of things. So even though that is the case, you still have conviction, however, that the way personal data is handled in Web3 is superior to what they're doing in Web2? Yes. I mean, if you look at how it's handled in Web2, it's not owned by the individual. It's owned by Google. It's owned by Facebook. And they sell it to advertisers to make money. With Web3, I can have ownership over where it is. It's transparent and it's permissionless. Marissa, I want to ask you a lot of questions about how you started getting building in Web3 and the project you're working on now. But one final follow-up on this thread we're talking about here. And the question is, do you see Web3 and the emergence of crypto and blockchain fundamentally about the issue of data? Because you'll see other places where people say, well, this is more about equality. This is more about economy or economics. This is more about a revolution related to creating a global village or innovation and technology. But from your perspective, is this fundamentally about data? I think blockchain is all about individual ownership, whether that is of currency or data or governance. The power of blockchain is in bringing that ownership back to the individual. So I don't think it's just about data. I think I approach it from a data lens because that's my background. But I see a lot of power in a lot of the other applications, such as the economics of emerging countries that don't have access to banking systems or creating a decentralized government that everyone has a say in the voting rights. All right, Marissa. Well, I now want to turn our attention to Chainbrain, which is why we're speaking today. And to kind of pivot to that, it sounds like to me, based on our pre-interview and some of the research I did, that you really got started building in Web3 and this idea of Chainbrain through hackathons. Is that right? Did a lot of your building start taking place in Web3 at hackathons? Yes. I went to the ETH TLV hackathon in January and built out a Sybil detection tool there on the StarkNet blockchain. We actually were finalists in the hackathon. It was a great learning experience to learn from other developers. And it really got the wheels turning in my head about other applications. Actually, at ETH Tel Aviv, I had the idea for Chainbrain, which I then built out a month later at ETH Denver. What was that experience like for you going to hackathons? You're in Web2. You kind of know what conventional corporate America looks like. And then here you find yourself in these hackathons, which for any listener that's never been to one, I mean, these are unique experiences. What was that like for you to just go right at it and start working on hackathons? I've actually done a bunch of Web2 hackathons in the past. So I was familiar with the hackathon environment. But one of the things that I liked specifically about ETH Tel Aviv and ETH Denver were that they were over longer periods of time. They weren't just a 48-hour sprint. I think one of the things with those 48-hour hackathons is you don't sleep, which is great for iterating and building something super, super fast. But then come Monday, you're dead. So I really liked that those hackathons gave me a longer chance to formulate my ideas and to think about what I was building and why. Well, let's talk about that then. So turning our attention now to Chainbrain, uh, you and I first met because you came to a graph community talk event where you talked about Chainbrain and what it does. Let's set the context for Chainbrain. What can you tell us about what Chainbrain is and how it works? Chainbrain is a no-code business intelligence tool that allows users to easily search and generate visualizations for any blockchain data question. Users can ask Chainbrain a question like, what are the top NFT collections by volume and by ETH that my NFT holders have? And we'll generate a visualization displaying that data. They could also ask about voting timelines, social activity, etc. Chainbrain is a BI tool that allows businesses to understand their ecosystem and improve business outcomes. By understanding their own data, businesses can acquire new users, prevent churn, and monetize customers better. 
Chainbrain came about from my own frustration when I was onboarding onto Web3. As a data scientist, I struggled to understand where the data lived and what it represented. And I thought that if I was struggling as someone that's super familiar with data, then others must be struggling as well. Additionally, when I was working at TeamPay, I was frequently asked to pull data for users. And I was busy working on other things, building machine learning models. And I thought that it would be awesome if users could pull this data for themselves. So that's kind of where the seed in my head was planted. So are you saying that ChainBrain allows users to, to type a natural language question into like a search field or something like that, and it'll kick out some analytics? Exactly. One of the problems with other BI tools is that it's really hard for non-technical users to access the data. Either they need to know how to code, they need to know the underlying data structures. But we make that easy through a data abstraction layer that we've coded in the back end to help understand the user's intent behind their query and match that with the underlying data. So all the user needs to do is type in their query in natural language and we'll automatically generate a visualization. They can edit it if they want as well. Well, this is all super interesting. And like I said, it's going to invite so many more people into the industry when they're able to use natural language and perform these types of functions. How does artificial intelligence form into all of this? I mean, with the emergence of chat GPT and all these other things, that natural language prompt seems to be unlocking a ton of potential. How are you and the team thinking about that? Yeah, I really think this revolution that we're seeing with GPT and other large language models is one of the biggest revolutions I've seen in my lifetime. I think it's fundamentally going to change how we work, how we live, and how we use the internet. Chainbrain is built on top of GPT. Uh, we fine-tuned a model, but that being said, one of the challenges that we're facing, and one thing that AI models don't do well, is abstracting the user input from the underlying data, meaning it understands what the underlying data is, but it doesn't really understand completely what it means or it struggles to understand what it means. So that's something that we're having to do manually ourselves is create this abstraction layer between the user's intent and the underlying data. Well, Marissa, I have no doubt that the more I speak with entrepreneurs building in the space, I'm going to find out that they're using GPT and other artificial intelligence tools. And of course, I've had the team at Semiotic Labs on the podcast before to talk about this. I want to ask you this question about the future. You've mentioned several times that you know Web3 is revolutionary, blockchain, and how it addresses personal data and data in the world. And now we're talking about artificial intelligence. I mean, sometimes my mind thinks that we're at this convergence in mankind where all these quote unquote revolutions are happening all at once. And I don't know. I mean, does that make me nervous or does that make me optimistic about the future? I'm not 100% sure, but would love to know as someone who's building in this space, how do you think about those things? I think change is scary. So a lot of people sometimes have knee-jerk reactions about, oh, AI is going to take over. Oh, AI is going to replace all these jobs. AI will replace all these jobs. It's like the industrial revolution. The workforce as we know it is changing and there's going to be new jobs for people such as more data scientists or machine learning engineers to help build out these AI models. That being said, I think that there needs to be more attention paid to the fairness of machine learning models to make sure that they're trained equitably and that the data is unbiased. I think blockchain has some really interesting applications for that where you can use zero-knowledge proofs to prove that the data that you trained on was unbiased without revealing all of that underlying data. So you're ultimately optimistic then about what our future is like, even given the whirlwind of innovation right now. I am optimistic, yes. Well, it's really incredible stuff. And more and more, we need to see in Web3 kind of a non-code, average everyday people type of tools and resources. Chainbrain won at hackathons, right? I mean, didn't you get awarded a bounty even from the graph? Yes, we actually won the bounty from the graph at both the UC Boulder Hackathon and ETH Denver. So we use the UC Boulder Hackathon to kind of kickstart our ETH Denver work. It actually started the day after ETH Denver started. So we built out our MVP there and worked for about eight hours on getting just the bare bones architecture set up. And we won a bounty there as well as ETH Denver for best use of existing subgraph. 
I want to double click on that UC Boulder event for listeners that don't know what we're talking about. So for context, this was an event held at UC Boulder, which is the University of Colorado Boulder. And this was for students there in the business school. And it was a one-day hack. What can you tell us about that experience and the level of engagement and interest in the students there? Yeah, it was really cool to see students coming together around blockchain. It was also cool to see some that had never heard about the graph or didn't know anything about blockchain come to build. Actually, we had to team up with at least two UC Boulder participants. So myself and my co-founder, we found two other UC Boulder attendees, uh, one of which is our front-end engineer. He had never heard of the graph before, but was an experienced coder. And we were able to feed him the data from the graph in the back end, and he was able to generate visualizations using his front end knowledge that he already had. Hi, this is Marissa Posner with Chain Brain. If my conversation with the GRTIQ podcast has been helpful to you, then please consider supporting future episodes by becoming a subscriber. Visit grtiq.com slash podcast for more information. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Grtiq podcast. Thanks for listening. So one thing about hackathons that are super cool, and again, I've had a lot of founders on this podcast and they've talked about how their ideas or their projects started in a hackathon environment, is these are like incubators for Web3. These are where people come together with a concept, build, win some bounties, and hopefully get to continue to build and work on their project. And so in the context then of a kind of timeline lens, where is Chainbrain in its evolution presently? We've built out an MVP and we're working with a DeFi protocol on doing a beta. We're looking for more companies to beta test with us. So if you're a Web3 company and interested in understanding your on-chain data, please reach out. I'll drop my socials at the end, but it's Chain Brain app on Twitter. We are still building out and looking for funding. And I'll also put all these links in the show notes. If listeners want to try Chain Brain or engage with it or see how it works, what's the best way for them to get started? I would advise them to follow our Twitter uh, at Chain Brain app. We have a beta release coming soon, so stay tuned for the link to be tweeted out. Well, as you mentioned, you won a bounty from the graph. You've already discussed how Chainbrain is built on subgraphs. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So you mentioned earlier when you first became aware of the graph. Can you take us back in time again and just tell us when that was and what your first impressions were? Because I got to imagine as somebody who's in data science, when you find out that there's something like the graph in Web3, you must have had some sort of aha moment or realizations about what the graph is useful for. Yeah, I remember listening to a talk by Yaniv Tall way back, uh, talking about how the graph was kind of like the Google of blockchain and that all of these data in the graphs were organized into subgraphs. And I got really interested in, oh, what's a subgraph? And this is a data structure and I'm a person that's interested in data. I think the biggest epiphany I had started when I was actually exploring all of these different subgraphs. We're built on top of all of Masari's subgraphs that they've created, as well as our DeFi protocol subgraph that they've indexed themselves. But looking at how many subgraphs there are and how Masari has done all this work to clean up these subgraphs manually has been super cool because it's just such a wealth of information that we can easily access. I have a lot of listeners that aren't technical. They're not data scientists. They've never built an app or even attended a hackathon before. So they don't probably comprehend to the extent that you do how important something like the graph or subgraphs are to a project like Chainbrain. But if you had to explain that, cast some light on how important the graph is, how would you describe that? The graph protocol provides a decentralized solution for indexing and querying blockchain data. This makes it easier for developers to build decentralized applications. So with the graph ecosystem expanding and so many developers building on top of it, I really believe that it's time to bring non-technical users into the ecosystem. And since the graph is one of the foremost on-chain data sources, I really do believe that it's in a unique position to help onboard the next billion users. As you and your team were getting started building Chainbrain, you had this vision for what it could do and the type of user you wanted it to appeal to. 
you probably had to make a decision about that data source. So in this case, you're using the graph, you're using subgraphs, but there are competitors out there. There are other ways to extract data from blockchains, including doing it yourselves in-house. Can you walk us through two things? Number one is why not just do it yourself? And number two, how important that decentralization of the graph is to someone like yourself, a builder in Web3? Indexing your own node is really time consuming and cost prohibitive. So since we built in a hackathon, that didn't make sense for us, which is part of the reason we decided to go with the graph that already had all of this index data easily accessible. I actually was doing a Solana hackathon a couple of weeks ago and was pulling data from Solana and the graph doesn't yet support Solana. Well, they do with substreams, but not with subgraphs yet. And I had to use Helios's API and it was much more complex. I had to pull the data off, then format it, and then query that data. So it just was a lot more steps, whereas the graph provides a much more accessible and easy to understand data structure right off the bat. And then to your point about how important the decentralization component is, I really think that decentralization is the ethos of Web3 and that not just one person should control the data. So by having the data decentralized, it's spread out among the community and no one has power over creating it or destroying it. So Marissa, what's yours and the team's long-term vision for your project Chainbrain? We want everyone to be able to access the blockchain data they need, they want, or they're just curious about, regardless of their technical skill. Beyond that, we really want Web3 companies to succeed and win out among their competitors by using our product, ChainBrain, to uncover data-driven insights that impact their bottom line. Well, I only have two more questions for you before I ask you the GRTIQ10, and I kind of want to make this first one similar to the last one, but more about Web3. And I want to give you a lot of room here to answer it however you like, but are you optimistic about the future of blockchain and data in Web3? I mean, what's your long-term vision for the industry? Yeah, the way that we interact with the internet is completely changing. I really do believe that Web3 is changing the world by bringing data, currency, digital assets, and identity ownership back to the individual. And I see a lot of implications for Web3, such as in government, in laws, financial regulations, and internet usage. I still think that Web 2 is an important part of our lives, and I don't see us moving away from that soon. I think the infrastructure supporting Web 2 is really strong. And as the first truly mobile internet, it's really embedded in our lives. But what I do expect to see is that as Web 3 grows, it is slowly absorbing and integrating some of Web 2 to the point that it almost becomes a portal for Web 3 to catalyze Web 3 growth forward. And the last question I want to ask you is going back in time to your career in fencing. And I ask this question fairly frequently on the podcast where I have somebody with a very interesting background. They've pivoted and now they're working Web3. And it's this question about, do you use any of the skills you learned or any of the talents or characteristics that made you good at fencing in your career and in your work in Web3? Yes, I think fencing taught me so much about myself and my relation to the world. Every serious athlete at some point dreams of going to the Olympics. And in 2015, I was invited to train at a super elite fencing academy in Paris with the number one coach in the world. And I took a year off from NYU and moved to Paris knowing maybe five words of French and about the same number of people. I was thrown into training 10 plus hours a day with a coach that spoke no English. And I was training harder than I ever was and I was at my peak fitness. About nine months into my training, I tore a ligament in my hand as a result of overtraining. And I was really crushed. I felt that everything I worked for was gone in an instant overnight. I couldn't fence and I was really restless sitting at a desk all day waiting for surgery. So instead of sitting around, I channeled my energy into hackathons, side projects, and learning how to code. This is when I really became interested in data science and figured out that I loved the treasure hunt for nuggets of insights. I kind of had to reinvent my identity at this point because my entire life, I had been the girl in the pink mask, my fencing mask. But overnight, that was gone and my definition of myself had changed. But instead of labeling myself as the girl with the arm brace, I became the girl who codes. 
there's a saying, be stubborn about your goals, but flexible about your methods. Fencing really taught me to see obstacles as just a detour along the way to my goal and not a dead end. So I took the opportunity to learn something new and create something that helps me achieve my overall end goal of continuously improving myself to be the best version of me. Fencing taught me the importance of flexibility, working hard, adapting to new situations, and taking a moment to think before acting, although not too long or you'll get hit. Well, Marissa, now we've reached a point in the podcast where I'm going to ask you the GRTIQ10. These have become very popular with listeners who are interested in learning more about the guests and also to learn something new, try something different, or achieve more with their own lives. So are you ready for the GRTIQ10? Yes, bring it on. The GRT IQ 10. This is the 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. What book or articles had the most impact on your life? I think Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It by Chris Voss, who was a former FBI hostage negotiator. Is there a movie or a TV show that you would recommend everybody should watch? The Prestige, directed by Christopher Nolan. If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? Ooh, this is a tough one because I like a variety of music genres, but I would say Watch the Throne by Jay-Z. How about this? What's the best advice someone's ever given to you? The best advice I ever got was if you want to change your life, you don't have to change the events. You have to change the questions you ask yourself. And Marissa, what's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people know or have learned yet? Learn how to use GPT. It will save you so much time. I use it for meal prepping, writing content, writing code, searching for flights, etc. I think the applications of GPT are going to be pretty much limitless, especially once GPT browsing becomes accessible to everyone. What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? Time batch and respond to all of your emails or messages twice a day. Based on your own life experiences and observations, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains how or why people find success in life? I think successful people take consistent action. Success happens because you put in the time and effort to work consistently towards a goal. It's not just one day or one small change. And Marissa, the final three questions are complete the sentence type questions. The first one is, the thing that most excites me about Web3 is? Transparent data for everyone. And complete this sentence. If you're on Twitter, then you should be following. Balaji or Andrew NG. And the final question I'm happiest when I'm building something awesome. The GRT IQ 10. After this, can I show you how deep the podcast is Marissa, thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. And I really enjoyed our time talking about this new project, Chain Brain, learning about the team, how you use the graph, and have won some bounties. And like I said, I've interviewed other founders on this podcast, and your story has all the hallmarks of being something. Very fun to watch, and I'll be cheering for your success. If people want to follow you, stay in touch with what you're working on, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, either at Chain Brain App or at my personal Twitter, at the Wizard of POS. Uh, or you can reach out to me on Telegram at Marissa, M A R I S S A M E G A. And if you're a Web3 business interested in getting in touch with us to beta test, especially if you have a subgraph, please reach out to me on Telegram or Twitter. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G R T I Q Podcast. Roger that.